Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the People's Forum. We're so, so, so glad you're all here joining in person in New York City. And everyone who's joining also on YouTube um, for our live stream, really excited for t tonight and the conversation that we'll have. So I want to welcome you to, to this space. My name is Hannah. I am a artist, an organizer, and a coordinator of art and culture at the People's Forum. I coordinate the art space, the Elizabeth Catlett art space that we have here. Um, and if you haven't participated in some of our programming uh, around arts and culture, or some of the, the hands-on art courses that we teach here at the People's Forum, please, please join us. Um, all of the information is online. We're also really excited um, to be hosting a revolutionary summer school as we do every year here at the People's Forum. So get all of the information about that downstairs on Pan-Africanism. Tonight, we are so thrilled to be joined by the, the Union of Artists and Writers of Cuba. Let's give an applause. <laughs> the union is a social and cultural organization of writers, musicians, actors, painters, sculptors, and artists of all different mediums. It was founded in 1961 by the Cuban poet Nicolas Guillén. And at its foundation, the primary role of the union was to, through culture, preserve the revolutionary project of social justice and national sovereignty in Cuba. Uh, the union stimulates artistic expression, debate, and creation, and continues to defend art and its role in the ongoing revolutionary process in Cuba. Today, we're really, really fortunate to be joined by Luis Marlote Rivas, the president of the Union of Artists and Writers of Cuba. He is also a radio and television producer and the director of Noticiero Cultural, an art and cultural news program broadcast by Televisión Cubana and produced by the Cuban Ministry of Culture. Uh, he was elected deputy to the National Assembly of People's Power for Santa Clara Municipality in Via Clara Province on April 18th, 2018 for the ninth legislature. In 2017, Luis was the recipient of the Jose Antonio Fernandez de Castro National Cultural Journalism Award, a distinction sponsored by the, the Union of Artists and Writers of Cuba, the Union of Cuban Journalists, and the Ministry of Culture to recognize works from radio, television, and written press published throughout the year. So let's give a big round of applause to welcome Luis to the People's Forum and to this conversation. We're also joined today by Magda Resik Aguere, uh, Vice President of the Union of Artists and Writers of Cuba. She's a director, a host, a scriptwriter for radio and TV in Cuba. And she is also the recipient of the Jose Antonio Fernandez de Castro Cultural Journalism Award for a lifetime's work in the Cuban press. She is a director of communications of the Office of the Historian of the City of Havana and of Radio Havana. So we're really, really fortunate to be joined by these, by these two incredible people who have so much understanding and so much to share in terms of um, cultural production, um, the role of artists and a continued, uh, the way that artists are continuing to share even amidst a stranglehold that the, blo that the U.S. blockade on Cuba produces. So we're going to discuss art and culture in Cuba, past, present, and future tonight. I want to start out um, with a question to ask both of you if you can talk more about the role that the Union of Artists and Writers of Cuba has played with, in Cuba with Cuban artists from 1961 until today. Where has the union uh, focused and where are you focusing today in the present moment? Apples. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm very grateful for you all to be here with us. And, and being here this evening is also like being with Cuba. And I also want to send greetings to those that are online, following along. For me and, and for Magda, it's truly 
an honor to be here and to also see the work that is developed here at the People's Forum. We're here as part of the civil society delegation that is currently participating in the UN Permanent Forum, Permanent Forum for African Peoples. And we are here just as a tiny rep representation because the, the main leaders of our organization that work from civil society and work around the, top, the struggle against racism and discrimination and they have still not received their visas. And so this, this makes our, delegate, our delegation very small. And that generally happens a lot to Cuba when we're invited uh, to events in, on the North American territory. And that's one of the expressions of the blockade against our country and population. And I hope that at one point we can have a larger gathering with many more cultural representatives where uh, we, there's so much more artistic to with us tonight. And as part of the UNEAC, uh, we started in 1961 when we were not alive, right? But it is an organization that during the last decades has started to incorporate artists and writers of multi-generational artists and writers. We are more than 9,000 artists all throughout Cuba. And together with the commitment of making art, we also have a social commitment with, with the country, with the nation that we built. And perhaps that's one of the one of the driving forces for us to not only promote the creation and promotion of art that's created in Cuba, but also this allows us to transform the realities that we live in. The UNEA uh, covers a multitude of different mediums, and that is why we call it the union of writers and artists. It's not a union like a labor union, but it's more as a as a space of convergence of different associations, an association of writers, association of musicians, association of artists that covers theater, dance, ballet. It's an association of artists that, a visual artist, an association of, of folks in the theater, radio, television, anyone that wants to, to create quality work presents their application for admission. And, and this is a structure that has reached all throughout Cuba is all of our provinces and municipalities. So we, this is not just centered on the capital. This is an organization with, with a vision, with a country vision and, and as a means to transform the reality it is an organization that, although generally those that, that know a, a little bit about what's said about Cuban, the media, people say that it is a country that there's no democracy, there's no liberty, there's no real participatory spaces. This is organization precisely thought of as a space to, to count as a, as a counterpart to state agencies, to governmental agencies, to, to, to advocate for artists. This is an organization that prioritizes artistic movement. We, we are interested in, in showing artistic expression and, and to dialogue uh, different topics and issues. And on the other end, the major contributions that the organization has made, but obviously, you know, aside from the art itself, the larger contribution is that social contribution is not just around artistic thought, but it, but it is a way of create, thinking through solutions for Cuba. We've created for more than two decades an artistic commission that works the topic around uh, around discrimi racial discrimination in Cuba. In the union, there is a commission and a and a and a form to cover uh, women and gender issues. Obviously, you know this is also in the within the context of art. There is there is a working commission of artists that are, that are concerned about issues around education. There's a, a commission that that covers uh, communication, social media. That you know, we not just 
promoting art, but how can we also create opposition from through creativity to combat that colonizer globalist capitalist system that uh, is imposed on us from the large centers of power? What is a creative way to express ourselves? It is a really vital organization. It has great social recognition, but moreover, it has many artists and writers that are interested in participating. And, I, and I'll leave this thought with you. I'm so trying to be brief, but as Cubans, we don't know how to synthesize and keep it short. But I just wanted to leave you with one example, the most interesting expression of, of the work that we do and, and we do have spaces, perhaps not as nice as this, but we have spaces in all of the provinces of the country. The most important expression that we do is in the community. We have really interesting community work that has a network of cultural workers that, that the art that artists display in, in, in the large galleries, in the theater circuit, in, 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 in museums, they also have a, a, a way to engage the communities that folks live in. And for us, that's really important. And, and apologies uh, for, for going over. Thank you so much. And if you um, want, you can pop that back Thank on. you for that. Thank you for that introduction and sort of highlighting of some of the, some of the key areas that Unyak is working in right now. I want to ask, part of your mission at Unyak is to fight against the commercialization of, of culture and art. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about what this has looked like in practice in Cuba in the last decade and how you think it might evolve in the future. This, is, this will be very interesting for us to, to think about from, from a perspective in the US as well. Bueno, buenas noches. And thank you for being interested in Cuba. And aside from Cuban culture, Cuba is, is so loved throughout the world. Certainly for us, it is a privilege to be here. And this uh, Manolo's invitation, who is, who we have a great admiration for because of his proximity and appreciation to, to culture and to ideas that have a commitment to the most human parts of what it is to be human, that, that, that exchange. And it's been, and it's so good that Hannah has been here with us to help facilitate this dialogue and to be that inter, inter, interlocker for these conversations. And I would say from the founding of the UNEAC, this, we have had an anti-colonial vision, which, uh, intellectual and artistic vanguard of Cuba throughout history and in many notable occasions has also coincided with the political vanguard. Our biggest uh, poet contributor that many of you are also aware of was Jose Marti, who was a man that lived here in New York. His statue is in Central Park. It was uh, sculpted by an American sculptor in Huntington who, who fell in love with him as a figure. And he also has a lyric that is impossible to forget that we cite daily as something very common, natural, and every day. And he also gave his life to facing Spanish colonialism. He was a, an exemplary man for and when he lived in New York, in the cold, impoverished, with the snow, said that he had holes in, in, in the soles of his boots, and that with the money for, from the uh, Revolutionary Party in his pocket, he was an honest man and had a, a proven commitment to national independence cause. And when you start to study the thread of Cuban history, that commitment uh, transfer from generation to generation. And perhaps there are other cases where that's not the case, but the majority of intellectual uh, artists that, that even transcend the national borders and, and 
are universal have, have generally answered that independent, anti-colonial, anti-imperialist call. And Marti is the example. And that's why from the Union of Art Writers, we can not, you know, we take on that life philosophy for independence, for anti-colonialism, which also has very much to do with what folks are trying to sell to us. That's, you know, culture, culture that we call it coffee, milk, very watered, down. It is a, a, a culture that is spoon fed to us as that is real art and literature. And we know that they're selling us a trick, right? A lie and that there is propagation of that culture in the media. And social media is a perfect place to find an abundance of supposed cultural offerings, which are really not true. And we know this. There's a, a, a kind of culture that does this, that has a commitment to, to true aesthetic beauty with that has social and human integration that respects the individual as they are, as they chose to live their life, with their likeness, with their preference, with their vision. It's also a culture that does not let itself really fall. identifies the elements that go against the human nature and have caused the world to be this awful space that we all live in, right? And so we, we bet on culture that generates change, that motivates individuals, that will place communities at the vantage point of being able to participate and create the art and also to build cultural values. And that culture corresponds with the, the lifelong goal of the Cuban revolution to plant the lifelong vocation for, for no, true knowledge and to cultivate what Martí also told us, that those that have a lot outside have very little inside, which means that all riches are nothing in comparison to spiritual richness and with the value that our identity represents. We are. And us from the point of view of when that feed into the philosophy. And that's why from our publication, the shows that we do on television, radio, the commissions that we Founded to talk about pressing social issues, we always defend that point of view, which also has to do with what Cuba represents for the world. This archipelago that many that many times they try to isolate us, that we are the target of so much hostility, but has still survived in their independence and in their solidarity for so much time. And that resistance culture that we possess has so much to do with the creative capacity of the Cuban people to be able to survive hostility. And that creative ability is also represented through the intellectual, the artists, the writers that we are part of the people, that we live in the countries that we live in, and that we also want to build a path to beauty that is so necessary, as you all know necessary as bread. And beauty is not necessarily luxury. Beauty oftentimes is in the smallest things and the most spiritual, the things that have to do with solidarity amongst human beings. Que, eh, Magda expresaba de alguna manera la filosofía. Que... Magda was expressing in one way or another the philosophy not just the philosophy of the organization as creators, as artists, but also the philosophy of the culture in Cuba. From, I remember Marti said to conquer all of the justice possible. Even throughout the complexities as we have in the, ter in the economic territory or even in, in the paradoxes of the human being, 
in the and then the history the historical ones lucky you did you know they add us to terrorists as a country and so we are if there's no resources for anything then it's also it's our, the artistic expression is also affected and so the the question was how do we view the commercial commercialization but beyond that not just the not to and we hope that you can also construct socialism and that you help us as well but in the middle of the situation of harassment of universal harassment, it'd be very ingenious for us as artists to think that we could survive if we don't try to penetrate that market of art. So we're against this dilemma of being outside of these me mechanisms, the international mechanisms. We can't. If we can't access the financial mechanisms, then we can't have. And people are their thread and the relationships that the the artist community tries to also have with us. So how do we resolve this? How do we resolve that there can be an an, an artistic wave and, and create a market for it? It's just one of the most intense discussions, the more consensual conversations that we have across the organization. There is something that felt that perhaps that perhaps doesn't exist in a lot of countries. There's a system, there are cultural institutions that create and, and support and finance art so that the artist can receive the salaries through the institution. I, I was talking about this earlier with the comrades and yeah, there's about 25 20,000 musicians and during the pandemic, during these two years, they had a salary without doing presen public presentations, but also having the consideration that they were creating. And in reality, they did this. And there's been an explosion of this, but that allows that the artist in Cuba doesn't have to work for the, the, the market market doesn't dictate the aesthetics and or the way that they should be expressing themselves or there is the creative diversity that's based on on the desire of each artist of how they their cosmos of the world and they can express this in their art and one and, and another question and perhaps we can write about this and we can collaborate but also very uh, uh, important for us to integrate ourselves into other markets because we want our art to circulate from Cuba. Because we, for example, in, in the musical sector, there's such a richness, you know, as you may know, the promotion of, you know, we have jazz, rock, rap, hip hop, but, the legitimate circuit might be the Latin circuit that might be dominating in other parts, for example, Florida. So that's a sort that's a circuit that we cannot enter. And and the artists suffer the repercussions of that. If, if the artist doesn't talk against the Cuban revolution, then you'll find very few people who can support them and allow their art circulate. So that's one of the topics that we have been working. I sometimes I believe in those who have been to Cuba and know us a little bit more. It's, I think that we haven't done well. We have determined a lot around with tourism where we try to make sure that the our Cuban expression is is seen and that's one way that we've done it. But today I think that the Cuban artist is worried how on how to penetrate beyond other artistic circles, but so, but without this pressure of having to cater to the wider market, and you know it's not 
and, and not be, having access to the commercialization also allows us to have expression. These topics, I think it's something that is on a lot of people's minds, especially as we talk about making art today and what it means to make art that is um, that is part of our movements. And so I appreciate that response. I also want to bring something that Magda mentioned, because um, for those of you who are in New York City, if you haven't seen the sculpture of Jose Martí at the south part of Central Park, you should definitely visit it and, and read more of Jose Martí's poems and learn more about um, him, because we do have this amazing sculpture in, in New York City, and a lot of people don't even realize that it's there. Um, I, the, you know, Luis, you talked you talked a little bit about the way that the the blockade impacts artists, um, but I want to give an opportunity to talk a little bit more about this because um, this this inhumane blockade really does create a extremely difficult situation for Cuban people, and Cuban people are are required to be extremely resilient under this imperialist aggression, but the challenges that artists face because of the blockade are specific as well. And so I want, I want you to talk a little bit more about the way that artists, um, the way that artists are able to um, resist the blockade and what the biggest challenges are in terms of the blockade for artists right now, um, historically and, and today. See, uh You have prepared kind of uh, a couple of questions that we have to go over uh, over a, a set of couple of days because we need we need more time to talk about this. Hopefully, we can extend our visa because they're very interesting questions. I I, I was mentioning when we spoke a little bit about the market which uh, indisputable it's a consequence of the coercive uh, actions against Cuba, our inability to penetrate certain things in the market. Today, this transverse all spheres of society, but also culture. I can also talk about the formation or the artistic formation we have developed an education from primary school to college education, artistic education accessible. For example, perhaps it might be a little distant for, for some folks, but in the 70s and the 80s, and even up today, but this was very powerful. It, the, the Cuban ballet led by Alice Calon danced a lot in New York and here in New York and is the creator of the dance bowling and and is celebrated on the International Day of Dance and 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 she passed away recently before turning 100. And she been sometimes being ballet. My issues are also blocking doesn't allow the, the market. Naturally, it would be for us to buy the shoes nearby. Yeah. But um, we have to buy the shoes in the market. That includes the shipping and at a very inflated price. And many and then we need to honestly do so much to get material for you know for artists and for music. Every every child in Cuba that studies with an instrument, the school provides the instrument for so this is just an example. If you study saxophone, and you'll get a saxophone. If you study violin, imagine a, this system of formation throughout the country. It, and taking into account how complicated it is uh, to buy the bow, uh, a violin, 
you know, or, or the pieces for a sex home with, you know, those are one of the consequences of the blocking. And then you mentioned that I had touched on in the last question has to do with the impossible, you know, that the impossibility of, of our artists uh, showcasing, touring, and, and you know their their work, especially on in the United States, they cannot. There is no way to pay them it, in the, you know through the legitimate uh, system that that represents their art, the galleries. So the production of, of music, we're not allowed to uh, share it on any platform where normally folks consume music nowadays, nor can we play the, the, the tunes in any in any events to promote music. So obviously, you know, folks know we have limitations on the internet because of the blockade. There are platforms to find uh, artists that we cannot access. So sometimes you try and if you try and download it, it'll you'll get a, a, a pop-up that says you're not permitted based on you know the geographical region to access X Y Z site or uh, app. If, if if I run through examples, I would have to go you know on medium to medium and and how the blockade affects us. And many times the blockade affects us in a very subtle way. I would I would like to you know let's say if I'm thinking of producing a a stage play or something. I cannot, I cannot show it as I would like to because the effect it will have on my life. And I'm gonna give you an example. Another example, a graphic, a graphic example. One of the primary facets of the blockade in the case of, you know, uh, petrol, we're, we're having uh, electricity issues and having uh, blackouts. And, that is affecting obviously our use of technology because any any technology that has any uh, component from the United States is uh, not from Cuba. We saw that during COVID, we could not get United States oxygen when people were going through terrible things. And the, the ships that touch Cuban ports to bring petrol in, in six months. It, there's frequent period that they have to wait to touch the United States again. So it doesn't encourage companies to uh, trade and do business with Cuba because it affects their business elsewhere. And and this uh, has ramifications in the culture uh, that are economic and, and run up to millions. And, and, and each artist can, can can express it more concretely in their own terms. And there's, and I also wanted to make another comment on the blockade. It is also a tie to a limiting uh, uh, expression, right? So when an, a human artist wants to share their creative process with an artist in the United States or show their work somewhere, this implies that, that makes it impossible. For them. And so we say that the blockade also violates the rights of folks in the United States and violates our rights as Cuban. And in the case of artistic creation, it co-ops an artistic liberation and, and limits their possibility of, of accessing different markets. And that's a way of co-opting freedom of, of expression because living in Cuba represents that you don't have the same rights as other creators in other parts of the world. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for these for these um, answers. I think it's really important for us from the from the US side to understand the way the blockade impact is is impacting people and um, and to find ways to to fight against it and we must be in the fight against it. The last question that I want to ask before we open it up for a couple of questions from the from the audience here um, is about international solidarity. So the founder of Uniac, the Cuban poet Nicolas Guillén, had a really flourishing friendship 
with the American poet Langston Hughes. Um, Langston Hughes translated some of the works of Nicolas Guillén. They met in Cuba, they met in the US. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the importance of international solidarity, collaborations between artists in the past, present, and ideas for the future between um, artists in the US and artists in Cuba. Bueno, eh, para seguir pensando en José Martí, José Martí siempre dijo que había grandes amigos en Estados Unidos de Cuba, que los había, eh, que los hubo, que los había y que los habrá. Y esa es una realidad que también nosotros vivimos. Nosotros nos sorprendemos a veces con el impacto que tiene la creación artística en artistas estadounidenses y con el, el respeto, la consideración por los creadores cubanos y con esa amistad incondicional que se va tejiendo entre las personas. To defend the independence of Cuba from uh, the Spanish Empire. And this has happened throughout history with many Cuban artists that have found fertile ground for creativity. Nicolás, the first president of Cuba, and I'm going to come back to the example. Uh, our current president did part of his time here in New York. And all a network of, of different artists and writers through uh, the Guggenheim scholarship. And he wrote one of his novels in the United States. And as you know, Ernest Hemingway also lived there for a lot of time. And while he was there, he wrote one of those unforgettable facts that you know that when you read it, you need to take it to the grave with you. And, and then we also mentioned that Alicia Alonso had danced here. And we know that the cultural fabric has been what has sustained the relationship between Cuba and the United States. But, but, that, but it's, got, it's got substance that the, the meat and potatoes of the relationship is through those cultural threads. And one of the most important observations that Jose Martí has made on the United States were a chronicle uh, in some of his texts. And you will find a large part of the history of the United States recounted through his point of view. And I recommend them to you all because they are texts that, that show the best parts of folks and also show his disdain for imperial uh, voting uh, system in the United States. So many other examples. For me, it's been fascinating to discover how many monuments uh, to Jose Marti exist in the United States. It's very moving and it, and it brings me to tears because I think Marti was here, he's here. And it, we it want take a copy of that sculpture to Havana, that sculpture in, in, in Central Park, so they can see that sculpture. It's one of the most beautiful, uh, and I would say even the most beautiful sculpture and of Jose Marti, which demonstrates him right at the point at which he is on top of a horse. He is about to uh, die for Cuba. And Huntington made that sculpture uh, almost as a non-Nigerian, non And in the Huntington Foundation, we visited the space where they had the drafts of that sculpture because she fell in love with Jose Martí. And the same thing happened with uh, uh, Nicolas King and Langston Hughes. I, I did not know the history. And because of an occasion invited with bus boys and poets in Washington, I visited those spaces. And much to my surprise, I found a mural where there was an American man that I was not familiar with and Nicolas Guillén, who I was familiar with, who was the first president of our organization. And that's 
where reconstructing history comes into play. It's, and especially there was uh, so much relationship building, particularly in the 40s, they were alive. And and today we we went to to Langston where Langston Hughes ashes are today. And so when we see those details that history places in front of us, many times that we casually encounter, we understand that cultural solidarity has had a great impact on the history of our nation. And it is, you know, it is not the narrative that's shared media and and now we we have certain projects in play to share that cultural thread of those relationships what a beautiful thing that langston hughes a uh, the great your great one of your great poets has, that was a great friend of the national poet of cuba so solidarity is a fundamental element to be able to establish dialogue this culture is when those dialogues are created there is no force that is capable of breaking that bond that's why we believe in the emancipatory power a uh, reparatory power of culture how beautiful i think um well to me that's really inspiring yeah <laughs> So um, bef I, I can tell, I know there are a lot of artists in the room today um, or people who are connected to the arts in some way. And I want to give the opportunity for, for some of you to ask a couple of questions. We don't have a lot of time, but we'll take a couple of questions. So Mia is going to be passing the mic around. Um, and I'll just, if you have, have a question, raise your hand. I'll, I'll call on you and then Mia will come to find you. Okay. Any? All right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't really have. Um, no, que no pregunta, pero um, yo fui a Hampshire College y yo estudié con UNIAC en 2014. I have a, a, a question, but I went to Hunter College and I studied with the UNIAC in 2014, and I and I would like to talk to you after. Full of of uh, of connecting a connection between places wonderful um other questions for for uniac for about this process about Cuba, about about. You want. <laughs> yes over here este yo tengo una pregunta sencilla pero no sé si tiene respuesta que es este
are also, for example, we're also on digital platforms, which is something relatively new, but there's already a circulation with our platforms and along with Sigma Day and other institutions who are doing this, we are creating, and I'm talking about the circuits who use the internet. If there are other ways, but I also think, and I also really like to, I also invite people to be stimulated by people, not just through the conferences, but I know that there's a lot of obstacles, but I, I hope that you can make your way to Cuba. I don't know, most of us, maybe we can help organize a circuit across the, the range of interest that people have, if you can come and see the places. Hannah and, and I were talking about that in Manolo and other friends here, how how we can have, for example, an exchange, a digital library with with uh, the historical books, but also contemporary books that that are being produced in Cuba. That's something that we would love to do. Perhaps to circulate the visual arts that are being created in Cuba. There's, you know, out of out of the little resources that we have, there's amazing works of art that are being done. Perhaps, you know. Remember that we have a rash a, a, a rationalized system. But I I think I think that uh, uh, for us a process so oh, by this way for us to be able to have the the digital access to the institutions who have like national and international access. You know, we, we're transmitting this. Cultural organizations and institutions are, these events are now being streamed online and, and in real time. The festival right now, the jazz, the jazz festival that took place in, in January we was streamed real time, you know, like sometimes it gets frozen a little bit, but you could hear the music and you can enjoy it. The the book fairs are, are transmitted digitally. So what we have to do is bring people, uh, reunite them and for us to share this and move to, to change and the dominant opinion that has to do with the narrative that's controlled by the media. But since it's us who our ambassador is here, Kiria Alan is here. It's a pleasure to have him here. He's here from the, from the United Nations. Talk a lot so that you can make it here. We're talking about how we can circulate our, um, Cuban art and what we can do to promote it, and also, and so in the in the meantime, before we we have to create alternatives, and we've been working with that. How I think it's a. In Cuba, there's a system of events. Why is an event important? Yeah, you know, obviously for the audience to enjoy it, you're as an artist, but the events are also important for so that artists are confronted with what we do, what level are we on, what is another artist doing? And so that system of events that the country has is very interesting. Right now, for those who like to, those who like the Caribbean, now the June 3rd, the 
Festival de Caribe, the Caribbean festival in, in the Mexican culture. In, and it's a festival that geared towards cultural and musical expression in other countries or other places. This is folklore in a pejorative. And the expression, the Cuban expression is really tied with the African richness and the Spaniard culture. And this is what develops that an, an entire it, this is even portrait of us too of us. And we've been able to have rumba that, that is, you know, a demonized and it's seen as as something backwards, right? Because it's it's part of our culture, our folklore. And it has to do with our black roots, our African roots. It's it's played on African instruments and and uh, instruments made by formerly, you know, the legacy of formerly enslaved people in in Cuba, and and this is uh, part of our, you know, perhaps as far as topics are concerned, the the this is so these are the worst parts of 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 Cuban culture. It's the it's the lack of knowledge of of many of expressions of Cuban culture. I'm sure that many of us will connect with Cuban culture in many different ways. Someone will do that with music, with theater, with with visual arts. There's there's cultural diversity. For example, one of the things that I like about the center that I you know just came for the first time, and that now I want to come and work. For example, all of these posters, uh, stereographs, you know, all of, all of that creation of, of cultural and political propaganda to share our ideas. No one would doubt that that posters, you all call them posters, right? Posters are a, a visual artistic expression of many. Uh, in Cuba, we have a, a, a a poster school. We have a Cuban poster school that has a renewed interest in in, in younger generations. Uh, we uh, award an international design award, a national design award, and uh, a twenty some year old Mexican um, won, and the revolution created this school and still exists. And and. We're talking to, to have that work be shown here as well. But from what you asked, we need to be honest. We, we do have complicated nuance, right? Because Cuban music is not allowed to circulate and stream on the digital platforms that any other in world inhabitant who downloads the music. That we have those restrictions placed on us. And so we need to try and you know find alternate ways of, of getting music. We do have a Cuban platform that uh, we're we're trying to basically make our own tools to circulate almost to circulate all of our products from Cuba as, as well as cultural production as well. And and unfortunately I didn't oh, I, I didn't present Ayaima who is from the Cuban Cultural Mission, who is extraordinary. They're an extraordinary promoter of, and, and, and so knowledgeable about Cuban culture, also tied to visual field and production. But I think our work here is to see as, as friends, how we can, you know, circulate things. You know, we've always had good friends here, but it's like always been a way for people to know the reality of, of any place, especially in the case of Cuba. And Hannah, I don't know if perhaps we can, you know, with the abundance of technology that we have, perhaps at some point in the future, and, and, and now since we're in a new era, uh, perhaps with, with everyone's help, we can help circulate uh, on our, the art on those platforms. I don't know if that answers your question a little bit, the other answers always come to Cuba. 
All right, thanks. How about you ask both questions and then we'll answer them together. Hi, thank you for sharing uh, about how around how artists produce work. A month ago, we were uh, part of a brigade with 150 comrades. And some of the places that we went to were children's performances, children's theater. And for me, that was so, so seeing acting and how children have, have you know, been able to learn as being as five years old. It was and you know, just when we were talking about the internet, I want to know in comparison to here, where where we talk about capitalism, that that is compressing us like a diamond almost, applying pressure. There's, there's tremendous pressure for artists, especially when they're they're young. Children are born as artists, right? And so, my question is basically, far as for children today, so how? how the use of the internet is used by the capitalist system. How do you fight so your so children are people that, that practice art that, that is valuable that's not just for the market or that's not dictated by the market? Do you have any like specific examples? The situation that you have is the same one that we have in Cuba, which means that we don't, we can't escape even if we have a technological uh, development designated by the blockade, even if we don't have advanced technologies, we are open, we open internet and, and any child of any age accesses accesses the internet and we have to be worried how children are facing this pa this panorama that is overwhelming because we have to think about the fact that social medias are created to, to entrap to bring them from a, a formation that has to develop consumerist habits and another one that has to do with controlling minds and we know this we cannot set off from prohibiting children's access to technology that, that that they're not capable of submerging themselves in that world. Why? Because we that's the world that we're living in. So what we have clear is that when you plant a seed in the mind of a child that you can conceive the real notion of the conceive notions of reality from a point of critical thinking, that's what we can display. And that battle is education. That means that it's very important that a child from a very from a very young age begins to receive information from an audiovisual world because they're born in it. And so how do we conduct them um, from an education, educational perspective that they're cultured because we know that the they're at a at a challenge with the the allowing of accessing uh, literature and hopefully develop a critical thinker. But it would be an ideal you know, here because you're here, you're developed here and you're you're able to so you have chosen a path of not uh, not being a consumer that don't let you, but you have been 
you've decided to be someone who, who understands where I'm being manipulated from. And I think that one of the secrets of survival with, with uh, self authenticity is the ability to discern, to be able to discern this world, but to understand when I'm being manipulated. And because sometimes social media are so sophisticated that that's the science of, of commercials that is that passes to the subjectivity of the individual and sometimes you're being bombarded that uh, that allow a, that places in a subliminal messaging of, of what's subjective so in the middle of that the avalanche of a vein of hu uh, human stupidity that goes uh, against what we descend, the true art, the true culture, how do we prepare that individual from a younger age, from a very small age, to face a hostile world? And there's an experience that you gave me, uh, you asked me for example, and I, can give, and I can give you one, and it's the uh, theater group La Colmenita, and it's, a, and it's a group that all of the country has replicas, and even outside of, of, of Cuba, because it's grown and and it's it's a sort of experiment, but it's a it's a company for children where they develop their own act. And they learn and they play and they learn and they play. The game and and and, and teaching have to do with receiving that in different ways, for example, visual arts, music, poetry, about their own own identity. Eduardo Galeano said something very, and I'm going to answer Eduardo Galeano said that in Latin Americans, we were used to see ourselves in the eyes of others because the majority of what we consume is our reality from the perspective of others. And the others, we know what the others want for Latin America. So it, with that, we have to be able to develop the perspective to see ourselves with our own eyes. Um. I have a question, but first I want to affirm what you said, Magda. I was on the delegation in Cuba, and when we visited the mausoleum uh, for Che and the, the guerrilla fighters, um, we got to talk to some young students while we were waiting to go in in small groups. And I asked them, um, when you go on social media, you know, in America, all our youth culture is around commodities and buying the new thing to find your identity. And I asked them, when you go on social media, how do you resist that? And very casually, one of the young girls said, you know, we go, we see it and we take what we want and we make it our own. And there wasn't a pressure to see something and want to conform to a capitalist kind of uh, set of values around it. And I thought that I think that's a testament to everything uh, you just said. Um, my question, uh, there's a, an American artist, Tony Cade Bambara, who is often quoted saying that the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. If you agree, uh, I was wondering if you could leave us uh, perhaps with some motivation and give us some examples of how artists in Cuba continue to make the ongoing revolution irresistible. Beautiful question. Thank you so much. Very beautiful. The expression of uh, uh, make our feelings, our thoughts, beauty. Uh, the seduction is very important to to uh, conquer our freedom. The seduction. Yo no sé si. I'm not sure if everyone who's here are artists. Because it would be presumptuous if here we, with the same passion that you have 
that you have shared the the role of the artist, the sensibility of the artist. I think that a lot of our people who have constructed Cuba and who have constructed our nation are artists in what they do. And it's our it's our duty to talk a little bit about the artistic development and what you're referring to. I think that I think that the best advice we're, we're pretty bad at giving advice, or at least that's what they say of us. Is to not let yourself get by anything. In the field of artistic and literary expression, perhaps the, the strongest creative expression that we've seen is with without fear. And We've seen people who just be committed to the youth and, and do their work in Cuba. There's a, a popular group in Cuba known as Buena Fe. People have done a boycott campaign in Spain that has led to physical aggression against the musicians that just wanted to sing and, and tour. And just about 48 hours ago, a great Cuban artist, a uh, winner of the National Literary Prize, and perhaps Manolo and Hana, uh, the people who are writing their poems about George Floyd, that in Cuba was very well received. Someone who's a, a researcher, a principal, a woman, a black woman, has taken upon that ancestral weight of 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 racism, and, and she has uh, put words to that. Her name is Nancy Stone. And three years, three years ago, we received uh, an invitation to participate in a in a very important event in Paris uh, to access, you know, a different market and you know folks have been invited to get places and 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 Nancy actually was able to be a uh, president of the festival because of her work because of and the prestige that she's ascended to in the Caribbean but uh, 48 hours ago two or three people ha that have you know, no real, you know, that are part of that anti Cuban machine. And then Nancy was kicked off of uh, being the president for the festival and they withdrew the invite together. And for us, perhaps we can. We can. We can take that, we can throw a bit because they have the power, they have the resources, they have the power of intimidation. She can see her role as a poet from one week to one another. What happens is that they have threatened her, they have created a campaign to boycott her. As someone Someone with dignity wouldn't withdraw their participation. The of the organizer was, was, and there is a law. Her only fault is looking at the music. The least that, that utopia is possible is forgivable in this world. And so I. The options and 
come out to community that it is possible for the well being. Expression of quality. All manifestations of art. Tell me right now, what is the difference? Even art, how do you get and the commitment? As the artist, stop seeing themselves in an ivory tower. No, the artist is in constant contact with with the people and the expression of that people that is in movement of the word how to say there's There's exhaustion because it goes against the to all the joy. There's a joyful, there's a completion of this identity. That this is what citizens can't can't go. Does it affect us? Well, yeah, it does affect former economic revenue. But I also think it's that you all won't see the reality if you don't talk to the people. And like, I think that the best way to, to do political work is to go see and, and exchange. As Magna, as Magna was speaking, we have a in, 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 in education, because there is a consistent requirement. So, if it is true that we are not a part of those who know or know it, of this world, Joy that even artists also do not have concessions between an art. They think not just the human to feel good, one of those things. Acknowledge what commitment is I think that we have to people you
Wow, I feel so energized and excited. I feel like we all are recognizing this incredible, this, the, the incredible importance that art and cultural work can have in building movements and building solidarity. And we have so much work ahead of us. I think that the, um, that what happened with Na Nancy Morejon in the Festival of Poetry is really an important thing to be talking about right now. And if you haven't read the full story, please um, read more about Nancy More Morejon and her work. Tonight, I want to finish um, this discussion, this beautiful discussion that I think will, will bloom into more and more projects um, moving forward. I want to finish tonight by reading uh, the poem that Louise mentioned um, about George Floyd that, that Nancy wrote in 2020. It's called Black Prince for George Floyd. Although his dream was to throw you into the Mississippi, that cannibal and opaque uniform has silently burned his knee into your inert neck. The smoke from your flesh rises to the wet sky, skipping among the flowers, the air from your bronchi, chases after its ghost until you bite the cannibal's bloody fang. And you breathe energy untamed into the wet asphalt under the still shadow of an apple tree in Minneapolis. Where will we place for you this brilliant, this immaculate black prince of ours in your memory? So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to everyone who's tuned tuned in on on YouTube and the live stream. Um, thank you so much to Luis and Magda for an incredible presentation for sharing so much of of your work with us. There's so much more to do together, and um, we couldn't be more grateful to to bring you into the space and to have you to have you here. So thank you so much. Um, enjoy, talk to one another. We have refreshments in the back and thanks. Good night.